Today's sutta is Tingsa Bhikkhu Sutta. Tingsa means 30. On this is on page 122. No? The sutta is at page 122. The disco- uh, Bhikkhu, of course, means monk. Of course, uh, better translation would be someone who lives on arms food. Bika, Bika means arms food. Hmm? So the, the, word, the word monk means someone who lives alone. So that is uh, a, a slightly different sense. In other words. But you should, nowadays, most English translation use the word monk, nun, uh, which is easier to understand. Okay? The Reference is S15.13, Sanyutta Nikaya, Chapter 15, Sutta 13. Alright, so <clears throat> here we have the story of a group of 30 monks. They, they, they kind of, uh, their friends, they probably were childhood friends, and then they, when they became monks, they, all of them became monks together, something like group karma, if you like. No? So now you've got four, five, six, and here's 30. Sometimes 500 friends also got, no? So we don't know exactly who these 30 monks are. The most famous group of 30 monks are during the first year of the Buddha's ministry, when the Buddha converted this uh, rich young man called Yasa. And Yasa's life story is very similar to the young Siddhartha. Then, when he became a monk, then his uh, five friends also joined him. And uh, each of these friends, they got their own friends, so they have a total of, I think, 50 monks, I think. And then after that, the Buddha went out on his own, and he was meditating. Then there were 30 young men who were enjoying themselves in the park, and he met them. And uh, then he, he taught them the Dharma. He asked them, one, uh, I mean, they, they were enjoying themselves. The 29 of them uh, were married, except for one. One is not married, so he, he brought a social escort along. But this social escort is not very honest while they were resting. You see, because this ancient India, even today, they, they wear this rope outside. Up, it's called the upper rope, normally expensive cloth, you know. So they were enjoying the past, so they put all these expensive ropes on one side. So this social escort, this woman stole all these clothes and ran away. And, and uh, so this young man, they were very angry, so they, they all ran all over the place looking for this thief. Then they saw the Buddha sitting under a tree meditating. And they asked the Buddha, did you see a woman pass by? <laughs> I never asked Buddha such questions. <laughs> the Buddha then asked the young man, said, okay, uh, young man, which do you think is better? You know, is it better to uh, look for a woman, or, uh, look for a partner, that is, or look for uh, yourself, you know? Of course, uh, this is uh, a deep meaning, you see, right? The, normally the Buddha will not talk like this to anyone. He won't talk to anyone he meets just like that. These 30 young men, they were ready. You see? They were, their minds are pure. Uh, they, they are enjoying good karma. And they are right okay, for, for teaching. So the Buddha knew this. So the Buddha just need to ask them this kind of question. I mean, normally if you ask this kind of question with a young man today, uh, which you think, look for what better? Look for a girl or look for yourself? I mean, the young man will say, look for girls, you know. <laughs> but this young man, they say, of course, of course, uh, Bhante, of course, sir, it's better to look for the self. Eh? To look for the self man, to know yourself, to understand yourself, right? So then the Buddha said, okay, listen, I'll teach you. And then, you know, they, they listen to the Dharma and they, they were awakened. So they became monks, just like that. So this was the first group of 30 young men. They became arhats. Okay? So this is where, uh, of course, the Buddha's teaching is for all levels of society, from the lowest, the, the outcasts, yeah, to the highest level, yeah, to the kings, 
even. All right? So all these various kinds of people, né? not just high class, okay, but all classes, depending on their needs, né? for monks and nuns, and as well as for lay people like us. The Buddha also gave teachings on how to live happily, a happy married life, the duties of a husband to the wife, wife to the husband, to the family, duties of children, and so on. Okay? So, here we see another set of 30 monks. Né? These monks are from somewhere in northern India. And this is near where the Buddha passed away, Kakusinara, this place called Pawa. Pawa né? So, let's look at the on page one, two, two, okay? The 30 monks of Pawa. Pawa is the name of a village. The Blessed One was residing in the bamboo grove in Rajagaha. Then some 30 monks from Pawa, all forest dwellers, all arms round goers, all users of heap, dust heap cloth, all three ropes wearers. All right, so they have this one, two, three, four qualities. Eh? These four qualities, they are very strict practice. They are extra practices. The monks don't have to practice this one. They choose extra. They're called the strict practices. I'll come back to this in a moment. So th these 30 monks, they are, all like, they, are, they are forest monks. They're not living in the group. Next line, all still having fetters. That means not awakened yet. Eh? Fetters are like the prisoner's ball and chain. All right? You know, in China, you have this, long ago, they have a piece of big wood. Eh? The prisoner's head is stuck there and the hand is stuck out there. You know, this big piece of wood. Eh? That's also called a fetter. So, fetters here refer to mental fetters. In other words, their minds are still not freed yet. Okay? Their minds are full of wrong ideas and so on. So, but they are their monks. They are good monks. So they approach the Buddha. All right? So we have to know, we have to make sure we understand this. Right? You will notice the lots of numbers that shows that these two lines are very important. There are footnotes there. Okay? Now, the, the Buddha allowed what are called 13 kinds of very strict practice. All right? Uh, one of them is to live in the forest under a tree, live in the open air, uh, use only three ropes, all right? And then there are some of them, they don't sleep and they don't lie down to sleep. I think there is a bit of misunderstanding here. Some people say that, oh, some monks don't sleep. But I don't think that's the meaning. The meaning is they don't lie down to sleep. They will sleep meditating like that, okay? So their whole life as a monk, they will sit and sleep. It's not that difficult actually, you know. Many beginners in meditation also do that. When they meditate in my class, they fall asleep. They like that. Okay, so the many of these monks, they sleep sitting, all right? Uh, and then the, they eat one meal a day and so on, okay? So here, these 30 monks, they follow four of the rules. They are all forest dwellers. That means they live in the forest. Here, forest doesn't mean deep jungle. It means uh, they stay in the outside the village. They can see the village, but they can't hear any noise from the village. That is regarded as the distance called forest, right? In other words, they won't be disturbed by the villagers. And in the morning, they were just nice for them. They can walk to the village, collect arms, and then come back like that. So they're very peaceful. Normally, they only go in the morning because morning people just wake up, and not many people. And then those who want to make merits, we say, want to get blessings, they will get some food. They will select some food from their table. Okay, they they normally won't cook specially for the monks unless uh, they invite the monks and nuns. Uh, Normally, they will take something from their table and then they will give to those monks. So these monks will come early in the morning. Nothing is spoken, you know. They will walk. When they walk, they will always look down there. They are not like tourists look up, look here, look there. They always look down. Okay? And the rule says they look down the length of an, a plough. Okay? 
the Indian plow. Okay, so about 45 degrees down. So they always walk like that. And occasionally only they will look up and see anybody wants to offer food or not. Whoever wants to offer food, they of course will stand in the proper quiet place. There'll be some food there. Uh, I mean, this is what I did in Thailand for five years. But I live in Bangkok, so the situation is quite different. It's a city. So we all, some of us get out at four o'clock, but by 7 a.m., the latest, definitely 7 a.m., you got to leave the streets. Because by 7 a.m., the Bangkok streets are busy already. It's very dangerous for monks and nuns. So, say 6 o'clock, the streets usually are quite empty. Right? And then there will be people, very peaceful, you know. You see Bangkok at 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., you know? different from Bangkok at, say, 6 p.m., you know. So, the people will stand at normally street corners. Because street corners is just to see, you see. And you don't say a thing, you just go up there and then you stand. Or we stand there, if there are other monks, you stand there. And then when your turn comes, you open the bowl, then you look inside the bowl. Okay? You cannot look at the food there and say, oh, I want this, this, this. No, you just look into your bowl and then the person will put for you. And then the moment they put their palms together, then we know, okay, they have already given their arms and we close the bowl. Or sometimes the monk's bowl is full. And we close the bowl, you know. Normally, the lay people are not very happy when you close the bowl and say, oh, yeah, I cannot make offering, you know. So we're very careful. We always watch and see, make sure that the lay person also is ready, they've given, then only we close the bowl. So, it is, so it's not exactly begging. It's a kind of like an exchange, like, you know. So the, the lay person will say, okay, I, I'm, when I'm standing there, means I'm going to give you food. The blessing is only done when the monks have go back and then they've eaten, okay. Now, the two ways these monks share their food. Right? One is the monks, forest monks, of course, they normally eat alone. But then again, like in this case, there are 30 monks, you see. So they probably will live together in a forest. Then they will probably, they may share their food or they may eat alone because they will eat from the bowl, you see. But even then, you imagine, you know, one monk, let's say one monk comes to town, you know, the one man comes to Singapore, comes to a temple, and he is old and respected. So hundred people come, you know. So hundred people come, and everyone puts a scoop of food into the bowl. <laughs> Total of hundred scoops. That's a lot of food, you know. Now, have you ever counted how many scoops you you eat, roughly? I once tried to count. I was eating at the food court. Eh? So I counted, you know, the one, two, I think my average at that time was like 25, you know, uh, average spoon. And I suppose if small spoon, you can take up to 30. But imagine this man gets a hundred spoons full, you can't finish, you know, a lot of food. You know? That is why it's not, it's not difficult to support monks, all right? So we just give a bit, can already, all right? So these 30 monks are like that, you know? so they get a bit each. Some may get more, some may get less. So those who get more, they will share with those who get less. Nah? Okay, so this is how they live together. Yeah? So that's the forest monks. They're all arms round goers. That means they, go, they always go to collect food. They don't go for invitations. They don't go to any houses to, uh, through invitation. That means go in and then eat and then chant and then talk. You know? They go house to house. There's another interesting rule. You see, when they go for arms round, they will sometimes they have another extra rule. You know, they will say, "Okay, today I'm going to walk along this street, this side only." All right? So he only walk along this street. You know? So if nobody gives, he will still go home, go back. That means he won't eat like, no food. <laughs> so the, this kind, of, these are extra strict rules for them to learn to uh, live a simple life, control their greed and so on. So it's your choice. They, they don't have to follow these rules. The extra rules, okay? Then the next one, they are users of dust heap cloth. How they get their robes. Now nowadays you see monks and nuns will wear very nice robes. They're all beautifully stitched, you know. Made in Bangkok, yeah, usually. But in the Buddha's time, uh, even the Buddha, you know, they will collect Rags, because cloth very expensive those Buddha's time. You know, sometimes families they have babies. They will clean up the baby with the cloth, you see, and then they will throw the cloth outside, 
or they were hanging on a tree. And then they were, in their mind, they would say, may some holy man collect this, and may we be blessed because of that. Yeah? So this like a custom, you know. So they, they put all these pieces, they're all little torn pieces, you know, rags, you see. They don't want already. So these monks will collect. So that means not stealing, you see, because that one is already understood, it's given to you. So they take that, and you've got to wash all this, you know, you wash properly. And you've got so many kinds of pieces, so many colors, a bit here, a bit there. So they get all these pieces of cloth, then they will boil them. Uh, one thing they use is uh, mangrove uh, bark, We've got brown color, you know. So that's why their ropes look brown. Okay, so they boil it to clean the ropes also, so that it's not smelly and it looks one color. So for us, monks rope normally be brown. But before that, there's something else they need to do. They need to stitch the ropes together. So the monks have to learn to stitch, you know. <laughs> All right? So the end product is you, you get like a baby's blanket. You know, there's baby's blanket with patches all over. So that's how the earliest monk's rope looked like, you know, just called patch ropes. And you know, they, they, don't, they, they don't have scissors like ours, they don't trim it nicely, you know. So you've got little sticking parts, you know, very ticklish if you're not used to it, you know. So they wear that. But there are some monks who are even more strict. They, they use rough cloth, like gunny sack, you know. So imagine, wow, that kind of cloth is even more rough. Right? Mahakasapa uses that kind of rope. So these monks, they use tasip rope. They collect all the straw, then they stitch and make ropes. Now the last one, it says, they're all three rope wearers. They only wear three ropes. In other words, the lower rope, sarong, eh? and then the one uh, above it. Okay? Then they have a third rope. The third rope, it, they use as a bed. They spread out and they sleep on it, or use as a blanket. All right? Only the senior monks have the third rope. Other monks, young monks who are below 20, only got two ropes. So this is called a three rope bearer. That's all they have. Other monks, sometimes they keep extra rope. See? So in other words, these monks, they live a very simple life. That means they meditate very often. All right? so, but they still not yet become like the Buddha. They still have fetters. No? So they come to visit the Buddha. Okay, I'm reading the next line now, section 2, line 4. Having gone up close to the Blessed One, they saluted him and sat down at one side. So that's all they did. They sit there uh, waiting for teachings. Uh. Then it occurred to the Buddha. Then the Buddha looked at them, the Buddha thought, okay. Okay, say, okay, these 30 monks, you know, wow, they, they keep all these rules. Né? Notice these are italics. Eh? That means it's all repeated. Eh? Okay? The Buddha knows. Let's say oh, all these monks are strict practitioners. Right? Next page. Eh? One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay? So all these, all these monks are forest dwellers. They live in the forest. They live very strict rules. They wear only three robes. They live on arms food. So the Buddha taught, section 4, and this is the key passage, né? section 4. What now, if I were to teach them the Dharma in such a way so that their minds would be freed from the influxes through non-clinging, even while they sit on these very seats? In simple English, how now? Let me awaken them right here. I will teach them something and make them become arhats, lohan, right away. Okay. Now this word influxes means all the things that come through our six senses, and they give us all kinds of ideas. One this, we want that. So a lot of craving, greed, and so on. So the Buddha said, I will teach them something, these 30 monks, you know, that will make them free from suffering, right now. Okay, so this is the teaching, you get ready, you know, listen, you might be, I don't know whether you'll be awakened after this or not, but something may happen, something wonderful. You know? So this is the teaching, blood or water, session 5. 
Then the Buddha addressed the monks, bhikshus, okay? Vante. Vante means sir, okay? The monks replied, in essence to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said this. Whenever you see the word Blessed One said this, the teaching has started. Section 6. So the Blessed One said this. So this is the key teaching, okay? This is the key teaching. Notice I underlined it. Eh? With neither beginning nor ending, or neither a beginning or an ending, big shoes, is this samsara, cycles of rebirths and re deaths, okay? This life of ours has no beginning, no end. Okay, this is the first teaching. Eh? Now here, I've simplified this translation. Sansara is not just our life. Sansara is all our lives, okay? Remember that previously we studied that uh, there is rebirth. We, we don't just die, we are reborn. So Sansara is a cycle of life and death, okay? It is also the nature of suffering, okay? Right, we all uh, are born, Oh, yeah. Someone takes care of us, we've got to go to school, pass exams, get a job, uh, be successful, get married, start a family, and then grow old, and then start all over again, all right? <laughs> round, 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 round. So, you know, some people think, wow, to be reborn is wonderful. Eh? But occasionally, you get very intelligent young people, you know. They said, wow, I don't want to be reborn. And he asked, why? He said, I don't want to go to school again. <laughs> I mean, you've got to start going to school again all over, right? But it's much more complicated than that. So the Buddha said this samsara, you know, no beginning, no end. It's a, like a circle, you know? All right? Some religion, are, they, they explain this differently, you see? All right? You see this... Uh, there are two ways of looking at history. No? In Asia, uh, Indian philosophy, and I think Chinese philosophy also, our history, our time is like a cycle. You know? I mean, you look at the clock, circle, see, no end, right? So you cannot say, where's the beginning, where's the end, when did, when did time begin? The question is meaningless. Time has no beginning. Everything must happen in time, you see? Right? So this is where we talk about space and time. And the scientists also talk like this nowadays. You know? There is no meaningful answer. No beginning, no end of time. Right? And, and the Buddha talked like that 2,500 years ago. The modern scientists are only talking like this, say, within the last 50, 100 years only. Right? So the other kind of religion, the religion that believe in God, you know, they say, oh, God created the world at point A. All right? And then we are somewhere here, you know. And then one day, God, for any reason that we don't know, will say, okay, I'm going to end the world. Finish. <laughs> Beginning and end, you know. But if you ask what happened before that, then that, that teacher said, don't ask, you know. You go to hell if you ask. So you can't kind of answer. <laughs> so, so you have a linear time and you have a cyclic time. Okay? So the, the Buddhist philosophy... Chinese philosophy, time is a cycle. Whereas Western religion, they say, oh, it is historical, point A, point B, but which is more difficult to explain, actually. Right? So this is the big difference between the religion of the East and religion of the West. No? So this is where the Buddha says, without the beginning, no an end, is this samsara, cycle of life and death. Section 7. Indiscernible, cannot be known, cannot be seen is the first beginning of beings, roaming and wandering, shrouded in ignorance, fettered by craving. We can never know when we started suffering. It went, go back long, long time ago. Yeah? Then, now the Buddha tried to show these monks how long you know, we have been suffering, our lives. Yeah? Section 8. What do you think, Bhikshus? Which is more? The flowing stream of blood that you have shed when you were beheaded as you roam and wandered through this long journey, these are the waters of the four great oceans. So here the Buddha asks, imagine, eh? long ago, those, nowadays of course you don't see this, eh? but it, say hundreds of years ago in, in China where the emperor is there, 
any robbers or thieves get caught, hair get cut off, and then blood flows. Okay? So the Buddha said, this, the blood that you have let flow, you know, so many lives you've been through, which one is more, you think? That blood or the water in the ocean? Now, these monks, so they know rebirth, they, they understand the meaning of samsara, right? So they reply, section 9, say, Bhante, as we understand the Dharma as taught by the Blessed One, this flowing of blood, Bhante, that we have shared when we were beheaded as we roamed and wandered on through this long journey, this alone is more, but not the waters of the four great oceans, right? So if you talk about so many lives, eh, this blood, wow, much more than all the oceans. That is, in other words, we have gone through many, many countless lives of suffering. You know? Then Buddha says, good, good, because it is good because that you have understood the Dharma as taught by me. Right? So say, at least you understand the nature of samsara. We have been in this cycle of life for so long. Then, okay, everything's repeated. And then the Buddha asks something else. Now something different. Eh? Eleven. For a long time, big shoes, you have been cows. And flowing streams of blood that you have shed when you were beheaded as cows, as you roam and wandered through this long journey. This alone but not the waters of the four great oceans, right? So, so imagine, you're also reborn as cows. And then this, uh, what do you call that, butcher, kill the cow, and then the blood flow. Imagine how many times you have been cows in the past, and suffering. And then this goes on, next one, session 12. Né? For a long time, big shoes, you have been buffaloes, right? So some of you are buffaloes. So imagine you're caught and then you're killed, the blood flows. If you collect all that blood, it is much, much more than the waters of the four great oceans. Now in India, they, they speak of four great oceans. You know? and of course, we today know there are at least seven oceans. We say seven seas. Né? Here, four great oceans, you can say northeast, southwest are basically oceans of the world. Okay? Now you may say, wow, that's a lot of, water, a lot of blood, right? This is the old way of telling us that something has been happening again and again and again, endless. Shoes. You have been sheep. All right? So you have all the Pali words there, nah? sheep, uraba. And then imagine this, you know, how many sheep there are, you know. In fact, there are so many sheep, they don't use the S for the sheep. Nah? One sheep, ten sheep. All right? So again, the sheep get killed and then we all eat them and, or whatever and imagine how much blood has been has flowed now notice the range of beings cows buffaloes sheep and next one is 10, 14 goats okay imagine buddha said you have been goats no? and then you have been caught killed and, and the, how much of the blood has flowed so notice this is repeated over and over, and then you listen to it and say, wow, okay, I'm born like this, born like that. So this is not storytelling. This is like a meditation, you know. Like you picture, you know. You know, sometimes you wonder, you know, you, there was this very rich young man here, I think in Singapore, not mistaken, you know. Remember there's a story about the monk who sold his Ferrari. Do you remember you heard this story? Malaysian. Malaysian. Indian, is it? Is it Indian? Yeah. So this young Indian man, his father is very rich, he got a Ferrari, you know. Alright, I don't know whether we have a Ferrari outside just now, somebody, no? Can we have a Ferrari? Okay, something that looks like a Ferrari, okay. So this young man suddenly became a monk. He decided to give up all his father's wealth and he also gave away his Ferrari and became a monk. What made him change his mind? He has all the wealth in the world. I mean, we all have, we have money, it's, we're not poor, we're not rich either, but we never thought of becoming monks or nuns, you know. 
And, and, and some monks today, they think I'm making lots of money, you know. There, there are even restaurants owned by monks and nuns today, you know. So you begin to wonder, what is it? What is it they saw in life that can make them change like that, you know? I mean, it's not something you want to do. So we all want a lot of things in life. Okay, just imagine this thing. Eh? Suppose you manage to get everything you want in life. Whatever you want, you, you get it. Eh? Suddenly you find life is not meaningful already. Isn't it? You know why our life is, is meaningful now? It's because we don't get all the things we want. So we have to work hard. We say, what's my meaning in life? I want to make money, buy this, buy that, pay for the house, pay for my family, right? So it's all short-term things, you know, but we have so many such ideas and that we never think in the end, what is this all about? In the end, what is it all about, right? Now, once you think like that, you say, oh yeah, what's, what are we all doing here, no? right? So this is when we look really far ahead, like the young Buddha, he look ahead, he says, what is all this? Eh? He saw the old man, then he said, Oh, I'm young now, but then I got to grow old, you know. So what's the point of all this enjoying youth? And then he sees a sick man. He says, uh, if you're healthy, it's for a while, then you still get sick. And finally, he saw the dead person. And that was the clincher, we say. He said, wow, even my parents must die. Those I love must die. This beautiful princess who's my wife also must die. So what's the point of all this? So he, he was a deep thinker. Most of us would say what? Don't think too much. <laughs> Go somewhere, enjoy life, you know, play mahjong, whatever, right? Don't think about it. It's because we don't think about it, you know, that we just go on doing things and then we're not really happy, right? So the thing now is most of us uh, don't see this deep idea of being a monk right away see, because we are happy. Most of us are like that, and we, which is fine, you know, it is not bad to be happy because when you're happy, then you will not go down to the born as animals and suffering beings and so on. You live together, respect each other, love each other. You live as humans, all right? Here, the Buddha mentioned animals because you'd be surprised, no? Many of us, or even most of us, it, anywhere, you can say, it, especially when there are lots of people, say in Singapore, you, you go to a crowd, many people don't behave like human beings, especially when they quarrel, when they get angry, okay? When they are robbers, their mind is not human anymore. You know, sometimes a Chinese mother will scold the son and says, uh, are you, you human or a devil, eh? Or it's called, say, Nang boti, nang kui boti kui, you know, in, in Hainanese. You know? So you are not, not human, no, you are a ghost. You know? What are you, you know? So, the, you know, this kind of work reflects very deep teachings of the Buddha, you know. So the mother is saying, what are you, you know? You're not even human, you know. What does that mean, you know? You know, when we are born, a uh, little baby, eh? okay, we have a human body, you know, but our mind not formed yet. Not form yet. You know. Our mind, we call it a, like a white sheet, you know. Not human, not animal. It's just empty mind, right? Then our parents take care of us, hold us, talk to us. Then slowly we become human, okay? We, are, we have a human body, but it takes about seven years for us to be humanized. That is why we respect our parents. Not only they give us human body, but they also humanize us, they also make us human, they also teach us to be human. The seven years they hold us, talk to us, feed us, socialize, we say socialize. Yeah? Actually socialize is the third stage, you go to school and then you socialize, you, you interact with other people. Yeah? Imagine you are born as a baby, then a monkey steals the baby, a gorilla steals the baby, a wolf steals the baby. This Baby becomes like a wolf. They are what I call, what's the word? Eh? These wolf children, you know? Okay? Right? Feral, 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 feral children. 
right? So they, they behave just like animals, you know, like a wolf. In fact, there are stories there. They captured this kind of one boy, you know, in the forest. He behaved just like a wolf, run on force, you know. It's like a wolf, so. but human body. So they, they caught him, I think in France or somewhere, and then they tried to train him to be a human. They can't, cannot already, because he's already beyond seven years old, you know. So the meaning of this is, we may have a human body, but if we don't act human, slowly we will degenerate. Our mind will not be human. Our mind will be animal, preta, addicts are pretas, you know, those hungry ghosts. You know? They are addicts, like, like to gamble, uh, what else, take drugs. You know? Then the, there are the, the, the hell beings are very violent, they're violent all the time. Okay? So you can have that kind of mind, although you have a body which is human, but the mind is still subhuman, we say. So that's why we have the precepts. Okay? The precepts ensure that we don't fall below that human state. We are, to keep the precept means we remain on the human world. All right? Why are precepts? So precept respect life, first precept. Number two, respect people's property, happiness. Number three, respect the person, right? the person's uh, freedom. Okay? Number four is truth, right? fourth precept. And the last precept is your mind. Don't mess up the mind. When you become drunk, the mind is messed up. Right? So this five precepts keep us human. And then from there, if you meditate, then your mind improves. You become better. You can even become heavenly, like, like, like a god. You don't have to go to heaven. Right here, if your mind is full of love, you're like a god. Full of compassion, you're like a god. You know, we all worship Kuan Yin, right? Why? We, we see of Kuan Yin as compassion, see? So you don't have to go to heaven to be like a, a god. See? You practice compassion, you have the god quality. And then you feel happy because other people are good, other people are also happy, you're also happy, you're happy with them, you don't get jealous of them. And then finally you're at peace with yourself. No matter what happens in life, you say, well, that's life. Some people get something, some people lose something. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. You are calm. These are called the four divine virtues, the four uh, Brahma Viharas. Love, compassion, joy, and peace. If you cultivate this, you live like gods right here on earth. Right? So here the sutta continues. Right? So the Buddha asked the monks again, you know, the, the Buddha is teaching the monks how long they have suffered as reborn as animals. All right? So look at number 15. Uh, number 15 is very interesting. Eh? For a long time, big shoes, you have been forest animals. Then you have square bracket. That means or, or deer. The Pali word is miga. You see, this uh, miga is a very interesting word, you know. When you say miga, it can mean deer specifically, or it can just mean forest animals. All right? You know, sometimes you go to a Malay store and buy food. Eh? Uh, when you go to a Chinese store, when you say meat, it means pork, right? When you go to a Malay store, you say meat, it means Usually mutton, is it? So it's the word meat, meat, you know? But different culture attach different meaning to it. So in Indian language, miga can mean deer, or it can refer to any forest animals. So this is one of those things you have to know about language. No? So here the Buddha says, he tells the 30 monks, you know, how often you have been a forest animal or a deer. And then people have caught you, kill you, your blood has flown. And that blood, if you collect, is much more than all the four oceans of the world. Now, no need to measure exactly, okay? This is not a technical statement. Here the Buddha is just saying, use your imagination. How much water there is in the ocean. But this blood, you have flowed much more. Here the Buddha is saying, how do you measure time? This time you have taken to suffer really long, okay? Then, next, 16, the Buddha says, for a long time, big shoes, you have been chickens. Ne? And then all the chickens get killed, right? 
you know, how much blood has flown. And then 17, you have been pigs, pigs that slaughtered, and blood has flown, and the blood of the pigs much more than all the waters in the ocean. Now, now the Buddha changes the tone, eh? 18. For a long time, big shoes, you have been village raiding bandits, eh? robbers, attack village, steal things. And then these robbers were caught. And then the king beheaded these robbers. Chop of the heads and blood flow again. You know, you have been robbers, so you're caught in the blood flow again. So much blood, like the ocean water. 19. For a long time, big shoes, you have been highway bandits. So now we know that in Buddhist time, eh, there are bandits who attack villages and there are those who wait at the highway, the roads. Eh. So again, these bandits were caught and killed and uh, what they call beheaded and so on and the blood flowed. Number 20. Now this is the last one. Eh. For a long time, big shoes, you have been bandits who violate the women of others. Right? So these are very terrible bandits. So they also, their heads were chopped off and they were beheaded. You know? And how much blood has flowed. So notice here, the Buddha is saying we have been suffering for a long, long time. Now this is what the Buddha wants the monks to reflect. And then next step, he tells them what to do, 21. What is the reason for this? So why do we suffer so long? Because, 21, because, big shoes, with neither a beginning nor an ending is this sansara, this cycle of rebirths and rebirths. A first point cannot be discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving. Ignorance and craving, these are the two things that make us do all these bad things. Ignorance, we don't know what's going on, right? Craving, we want this, we want that, so we get into trouble because of that, right? 22. For such a long time, big shoes, you have suffered painfully, suffered deeply, suffered disastrously, swelling the graveyards. Well, wow, this last <clears throat> phrase, swelling the graveyards. You know, you look at the graveyard much more. They're growing, you know. Now, this is a problem again. In Singapore, you don't see graveyards. They're digging out all the graveyards. And they put the building, <laughs> high rises on it. But if you have a chance, you go to Malacca, my hometown. Eh? You have the biggest uh, hill. In Chinese, the word hill means so as you bury people, isn't it? So go to the hills, you know. So the it's called Bukit China, it's called Chinese Hill no? in Malacca. Actually, it is at least two hills, no? two or three hills. One is called Jolotong, and another one is called, uh, I forget what's that second one, it's called Bukit Gedong or something. My mother, my parents are buried there, my grandma also, and grand grandparents, and go back to, I think, seven generations, you know. Then the last, first one came from China. So it's seven generations that, on that hill. You go to the hill, you see this whole place, as far as your eyes can see, they're all graves looking like turtles. Everywhere. So in the end, you say, wow, there are more dead people than living people in this world, right? So that's why in Singapore, land is so precious. You know, you cannot bury, you must burn the body. But if you burn the body, you don't see them you know, anymore, right? So we don't really think about the dead people. But when you see that kind of hill, you begin to wonder, wow, how many dead people? So you can reflect on the hills. So you don't say, wow, very nice stone eh? and so on, nice feng shui. Eh? You look and you say, mm, look at all these dead people. How many of them, how many generations they have died? They all have lived like us. And after that, they are put together. And if you are rich, you know, you can book the grave, you know. I think they call it what, Siang Kong, is it? Anyway, my, my grandfather... He was a rich man before the World War, you know. After the war, there was a depression and he lost everything. So I was born when they were poor. 
So when he passed away, uh, he, he had four wives. The first three wives passed away. They all had their separate graves. Then he passed away. And he has this very big grave for two. Because the youngest grandma, that's my grandma, I think she's the one, they, she booked a place for her. She said she wants to make sure that she's buried beside him. Very Chinese you know, idea. No? All right? So they booked a place, you know, so got a home after passing away, so to speak. So it's a double, very big kind of uh, grave. But you don't see this kind of graves nowadays. It's a luxury. So this is a reflection on death, you see. You, you see all these graves, but we all lose all these people after a while. You know? So the, the Buddha is telling the monk, say, you know, you look at yourself, you have been all these animals for so long, you suffer, you know. Because why? Sansara is very long. It's like this you stay in this prison very long, you know. Now the Buddha's lesson, huh? 23. So the Buddha asked the monk, surely bhikshu, surely monks, this is enough to feel revulsion towards all formations, huh? Revulsion, that means you, you don't want it. You say, well, uh, well except all this is. Huh? Formation means whatever you see around you, things which are created. Enough to become dispassionate. You, you just don't feel like it anymore. You just say, enough. Huh? Enough to be liberated from that. You just want to free yourself. Say, how do I free myself from all this? Right? So, okay, if I'm poor, I have to work hard, get money. Now, if I get money, if I'm rich, I want to be richer still. Maybe the richest man in the world. When I have all the money in the world, what do I do? You don't know what to do, you know, right? So, then you ask yourself, is that all to life? So, this is what the Buddha is asking the monks. He says, don't you think of freeing yourself? All right, so then the Buddha remains silent. Huh? 24, the Blessed One said this. Satisfied the monks with joy in the Blessed One's word. And then the conclusion, 25. Now while this exposition was being given, while the Buddha was talking, the minds of the 30 power monks were freed from the influxes through non-clinging. So they became free, no more suffering, they became arhats, became lohan. Okay? So because they were ready, see? so when they just listened, they understood. Huh? Alright, so this is a reflection on death. This is given to the monks who are ready. All right? Then you may ask me, you say, ah, but I'm not a monk, I'm not a nun. I want to live happily now, so what do I do? Now, we all have been to funerals of our friends. No? My own brother passed away. Many, many years ago, I told myself, oh, I'm still young, you know. My generation are all still alive. Then my brother passed away. I said, oh dear, that's the first one to go. My sister is still around. She's 82. It's good that she's still strong. I hope she remains strong, okay? <laughs> now, I'm like 14 years younger than her, I said. Huh? 84. 84, okay, right. 84, yeah. So, you see, the thing is, when I look at my brother passing away, I said, wow, we knew each other so well, you know, and then he's gone, just like that, you know. So, what does it mean to us? Then I tell myself, who else do I have left, you know? My, my parents are so gone, you know. So, we learn to treasure people who are still alive, you know? Maybe your relatives are far away, may not be here with you, that's okay. But there is a saying, you know. The Buddha says, those you trust, those you are close to, those you really love and those who love you, they are your real relatives. They are your true relatives. So treat them well. In other words, then, no? You see, because notice again here, we, we have been reborn so many times. Eh? There's another sutta, eh? which the Buddha said, you know, you have been reborn so many times, 
But this one is a very, very frightening one. Huh? We are born as animals, right? But this was a happy one. The Buddha says, you know, you have born so many times, a long, millions and millions of times. You cannot say that you have not been a father to each other, mother, sister, brother. So we all have been connected, you know. So in other words, according to Buddhism, we all somehow are connected to each other, right? So don't feel sad. Nah? Don't say, oh, my parents passed away already, or my relatives are far away in China, or Philippines, or whatever, <laughs> you know. Because whoever you love are close with you right here, right now, they are your relatives. The meaning is, if you treat them well, they treat you well, you're happy. That's the way relatives should be. If you have a family, but the people don't love each other, you'll be very sad. You're not family, you see. So, if you have friends who love you, care for you, family who love you, care for you, people near you who love and care for you, that's your family. You begin to value them more. So, death is not something, uh, what you call, bad in, totally. It means we all have a shelf life. We must treasure what we have right now. Treasure it. Because it's not going to last forever. And once you understand that, that there is value in this life, then you will live happily. You will live with purpose. Okay? You begin to see the meaning of life. So when you see meaning of life, that means you have purpose of life also. They go together. So that's the lesson of this teaching. Eh? It's not to feel sad because everyone dies. Eh? It is to see value in life. All right, I finished exactly at 12 o'clock according to my watch. Okay, so I'll stop here for a while. If you have any questions, you can ask. So when we read the Buddha's teachings, sometimes we have stories, you know. But even the stories, you must always reflect. To reflect means you ask yourself, what does this mean for me? Is this happening now around me in my life? You must reflect like that. And then ask the very important question, what shall I do? What shall I do? Very important. Eh? You know, a lot of people have problems. They never ask that question, you know. Instead, they go to some other people who don't have the problem. They say, what, uh, tell me what to do. Of course, those people always give wrong answers, you know. Uh, they're fortune tellers, they're all kinds of people just want to, you know, make some money, you see. But the Buddha say, if you have a problem, ask yourself the question, what shall I do next? That's the way. No need to see fortune teller, no need to go for... I mean, you can ask your good friends, yeah. But that's the question you must ask, what do I do next? In fact, the, the Buddha said in a number of words, he says, if you have tried your best, you put in everything you can, but things still do not work out. Then ask yourself, what do I do next? If you are a professional, you are a, someone who works, you know, this is the question you must ask. What do I do next? What's the next best thing I must do? And that's the most logical thing. You don't sit down and cry. It, it won't help. What do I do next? Right? That's called motivated. That's called motivated. And, and this is the Buddhist way. Okay, remember, today you forget all, my, all the teachings. Right? You say, you go back and tell yourself, ask yourself, what do I do next? Nah? That's the question. What must I do now? Or, what must I do now? Also can. What must I do now? One of the great things in life as a Buddhist is to ask the right questions. You don't have to get the answer. No? You ask the right question, the answer will come. Okay? Okay, any feedback? Any questions? Yes? Oh, okay. Yes, question? <laughs> okay, both ask. <laughs> huh? The question is... That's the question. I'm asking. As a woman, we die, we die as a human. How come can we go to your animal? Because of the mind, because of the mind, how we think, you see? Do you see sometimes that uh, people are so bad, very wicked, uh, we say, wow, this person is like an animal, very fierce, right? You know, sometimes people, robbers, uh, they stay in the dark, they come out at night only, you know? 
and they wait for to them people are not people people are victims they steal from them rape them kill them normal human beings don't do that so their mind is always dark night they come out at night only and then they see people oh how much money can i make for the person how shall i kill this person right the mind always like that so if your mind always like that and then all your life you are like that huh? then when the pers- when the person dies human body die what kind of mind animal mind dark mind so this dark mind like a dream you know you will move on and then look for animals and then they are reborn when the baby animals are becoming what you call the baby and inside the womb they were consciousness to go inside and then they become those animals we become what we think you see a drug addict same thing also we say wow this drug addict doesn't behave human huh? he's so addicted he wants the next fix we say and he will do anything he will rob from the mother kill parents just to get the drugs not human right? like like hungry ghosts like that so what the buddha say you don't have to go into heaven anywhere here you can see this kind of people so that's why we don't want to behave like that no we all in many ways if you can come here and study so tells you all are at least human you know but you know we all stay in a crowded area with, with all these multi story flats i don't like sundays and you know, holidays you know why it's quiet yes suddenly you hear somebody scream you know shout at the children you know scores i ho they pity the child you know, they scold the child shout 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 and I, you know what's going to happen to the child you see that's not human treatment and another one the man will shout at the woman so wow you know you, you see they're not human so they do angry a lot of anger if you have a lot of anger like a demon you see because you see when people are angry their face different their mental state different they they will kill what they love and then they say oh why do i do that very stupid right so the buddha is trying to prevent it says don't fall into hell now you don't wait don't wait for hell after you die now you can fall to hell you go to some place i want to get bomb shoot kill huh? that's hell We, we live in a very peaceful place we don't see all this but when you see all this bombing people dying hundreds dying at the same time we say oh yo this is terrible so the mind all right so remember we, we are very fortunate we are very lucky here we live happy peaceful our mind is good you go to some places the people's mind are different so we have to be very careful with the kind of person the kind of place so remember it's the mind eh? how we think we become how we think so if we think over a long time like that then next life will we become like that in this life we get angry a bit once or twice that's okay you know and then after we say oh wow this is bad then you know why you're angry you say oh, i should not be angry you correct yourself you fall down you get up you see but it, some people they are by nature all the time angry all the time violent all the time wants to kill people all right any other questions can st- yeah yeah sure the people coma so what's oh. their mind at that time mm mm-hmm. wow coma really really oh. tricky you, know? you see this uh, in 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 buddhism the consciousness uh sometimes can like you you very hard to notice that uh, consciousness uh. even the body is technically dead we don't know that's why there is the we have the custom of keeping the body for seven days uh, make sure the person is dead you see because sometimes the person comes back you know not really dead all right coma it's very tricky because the again the many possibilities no? so i'm only just telling you some possible uh, ideas no? not total no? because the doctor will tell you there's so many kinds of coma no? so someone is in a coma one possible thing is the the person will still be aware what's going on outside you know but cannot the the body doesn't work so it cannot respond the consciousness we see out of body 
experience, uh, OBE, yes. So the consciousness is floating around and then you can see the body. Right? And it, so this is where the, problem, the person is not trained, the person has a lot of fear. But if you study Buddhism, you mm. learn about all these things, you say, oh, that's my body, you know? And, and you, you're not afraid, is it? You, you understand, is it? So this person, uh, that's one scenario. You can be afraid. So that's, where, that's why we, as Buddhists, when a person is in a coma, we gather around this person, we do loving-kindness meditation. In our mind, we, we think all the happy thoughts, may you be well, may you be happy, we, we send our thoughts to this person. That's one way we help this person to be positive, not to be afraid. All right? Another way is, let's say husband and wife. Husband is in a coma. Then the wife will talk to her. Keep on talking, say, keep your mind clear, think positive. You know? uh, if you see anything that's not, not happy, you let go, let go, don't cling to it, don't fear. So you go on talking happy things to this person. Because any time the person passes away, the person will let go, then he will be happy, you know. So coma is a state where we are not sure whether it's aware or is the body functioning or not. But we assume this person can sense us, so we try to say something good, keep this person going until the doctor say, oh, this person is technically dead already, okay? Otherwise, we talk, you can hold a hand, treat the person as if the person can, can sense you, all right? But we, we really don't know exactly whether this person is dead or not. So, a, a Buddhist will not agree to switching off the machine. This is a big problem, you know, there are many opinions, right? So, but in the end, because the Buddhists will never say, oh, you can do it, that means you can kill. <laughs> wow, your karma will be terrible, you know? The best you will say is, you better get the advice of at least three doctors. Or, uh, or one doctor, one lawyer, uh, another very good religious teacher, <laughs> three people, <laughs> ask them carefully, what do they think? And then you decide for yourself. And then you find out this person, in Singapore, what do they call that? A medical advice or something? Yeah, yeah, it's some kind of, you know, instructions. Then only you decide, because this is something you cannot freely allow to happen. Very dangerous, isn't it? So, at, in our time, we can't do much, you know, but in the future, you know, maybe medical ed, science will be so advanced, you can help this kind of people, then our attitude towards coma will be different already. We can bring them back, is it possible? So now you've got to treat them as if they're like asleep, they cannot respond, but they can sense you, they can hear you, like in a dream like that. So talk to them, calm them, tell them to be peaceful, be at peace, especially if they're dying. You tell them, let go, don't get attached to anything. Because if they attach, then they, they will suffer. See? We want them to let go, get a new life. It's just like when someone dies, it's like, okay, I'm here and you are there, you want to go away, you know. But you, you like the family so much, you can't go away. You want to go, come back, go, come back. Say, no, you go, you're okay, we'll meet again, you know. So you go away happily. So we want the person to go away happily, like that. Let, that's that's mean of letting go. So those people who die, they can't let go, they will suffer. In Buddhism, we talk about intermediate state. So they do get caught in the intermediate state. Intermediate state is, oh, that's nothing there, you know, in the sense that they're not human, they're not any of the states. So the mind is like, like nothing like that, you know. They, they, they're not any beings. So they have to come out of that state to be reborn properly. Otherwise they will suffer. A lot of fear, there, a lot of desire. So I don't know if this helps or not. Basically you've got to be, talk to them, hold their hand, make them feel comfortable until you're sure they have passed away. Then sometimes they come back and they say, hey, I can. I heard what you say. <laughs> you, then, then you're very happy, you know. So don't need to cry. Eh? <laughs> I don't like people crying anyway. <laughs> so you, you, I am in a coma. You talk to me will be not very nice. I think. <laughs> I'll read suttas to me. <laughs> okay. 
Have any other comments? Let us just sit peacefully for a while. This is a one moment that we don't always get just to be at peace with ourselves, to sit here, to remember all the important, really important things in life. No? Are we really happy? How to be really happy? Uh, what should I do next to be happy? What is the meaning of happiness? So we ask ourselves all these basic questions so that our life is of very high quality, that we are truly human, maybe even higher than human. And it is possible when we reflect in this way through the Buddha's teaching. Reflecting in this way is very good karma. But the power of such karma, may we be well and happy, may we be at peace with ourselves, may we have the wisdom to do the right things and bring happiness to others too. Above all, may we have the courage and wisdom to aspire to stream winning in this life itself. May our loved ones to be well and happy. May those who are practicing the Dharma to reach their goal in this life itself. And may those who are lost to find their right way back to the Dharma in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.